We're of course talking about promising tools, methodologies, algorithms. These are the, uh, the thoughtful pieces of work that translate data into, in many cases, the usable information for decision making. Um, what we're going to focus on in the panel is we're going to highlight some of these uh, from different organizations uh, around the country, uh, talk about, uh, you know, explain them, talk a little bit about um, the value, also talk about uh, some of the, the future paths both perhaps for these tools but also for some of the others that are needed. So we've got uh, five, five presentations to go through and the format of the session is each speak, speaker is going to have about eight minutes and then uh, and we'll see how that goes. I'll be the timekeeper and they've all been uh, forewarned on that and, uh, and then we'll have some, uh, some Q&A at the end so we look forward to, uh, to your questions and comments. I'll briefly uh, introduce each and then uh, we'll get to it. There are, um, uh, the, bi the bios of all the speakers are on the website, so uh, with, uh, with the panel's agreement, I'm, I'm simply going to introduce them and uh, for further information on their bios, you can uh, attend to that, or you can refer to that. And uh, I won't actually jump in in between, we'll just have everybody go uh, in order. So we're gonna start with uh, Rick Berthwistle. And Rick is the, uh, as a professor of family medicine and public health sciences and the director for the Center for, Center for Studies in Primary Care at Queen's University. So Rick will speak first. And Michael Schuhl will be second. He's president and CEO of the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences. And then we'll have Martha Bird. She's the director of health systems analysis at the BC Ministry of Health. And then my colleague Douglas Yeo, who's the director of methodologies and specialized care at CAIHI and Claudia San Martin, not last but not least, uh, Assistant Director, Health Analysis Division at Statistics Canada. So I'll just let everyone know too, all the slides are in one file, so we'll just uh, be able to go continuously through those and we'll start with Rick. Um, I'd like to uh, talk to you today about uh, the Canadian Primary Care Sentinel Surveillance Network uh, that um, we have been in business since about 2008 uh, collecting uh, electronic medical record uh, information from um, uh, patients across the country. Um, and I'll show you, this is a ve very, um, uh, one slide of, uh, of what uh, Sipson looks like, we call it, um, we call it Sipson. We have about a million patients now uh, as part of the database. This is de-identified electronic medical record uh, information uh, from about a thousand practices um, in uh, eight provinces and one territory. We have um, 11 different uh, practice-based research networks, so we're, uh, we're really a network of networks. Uh, our data probably is more reliable from 2008 um, forward. Uh, we have the EMR data back to t about 2003. The funding has been, uh, was from the um, Public Health Agency of Canada. We have about, had about $12.5 million of funding over the period, time period. Um, and we have strong partnerships with a variety of places, uh, including the College of Family Physicians of Canada um, and uh, universities across the country. This is a, a quick snapshot of uh, the type of information or data that we collect and extract from electronic medical records. Uh, we do also have uh, provider uh, profiles, um, but we have some uh, demographics of the patients. Uh, obviously, this is uh, anonymized information, although each patient has a unique uh, Sipson number, so we can track them over time and over extractions. Uh, we have encounter data, um, disease and health condition, uh, some risk factor data such as smoking that we've cleaned up, um, blood pressures uh, and uh, weights that are um, very useful as well as medications prescribed and some lab data. Uh, this, these are the chronic diseases in which we've created a valid case definition uh, and we're obviously working on new, new chronic diseases because this doesn't cover the water waterfront, uh, but we have uh, a large number of patients in our, our database with each of these chronic conditions. And of course, one of the advantages of electronic medical records is that you can actually look at multimorbidity. 
I'm going to talk uh, brief, very briefly, about uh, three research tools and methodologies that we've developed uh, as part of this. Um, the first is for uh, practice and system feedback. This is a, a really a, a, a very um, uh, a piece of, 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 the, of a dashboard that we've developed. Uh, this particular one is around all hypertensive patients in this particular network. But we can uh, use this information and this, this tool to, um, at the practice level, so to give uh, physicians uh, feedback about their own practice. And we also have um, now started to pilot this with the Southeast Lynn in Ontario. Um, we have uh, about a third of the patients in that Lynn as part of, of Sipson. So we're starting to use this uh, tool. It's a very dynamic tool that we can start to, to look at chronic disease within the population. And obviously, um, um, health links and others are interested in those um, high users in the system. And this uh, will be a helpful um, tool for that. The second um, uh, method and, and tool we've uh, developed is, um, or been involved in, is a CI uh, 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 Infoway uh, funded project um, around meaningful use of electronic medical records. These, uh, this particular tool uh, uses SIPSIN process data. It was developed by um, Archimedes uh, Indigo, now with Evadera. Um, and it's a tool which um, calculates and displays um, cardiovascular risks uh, and cardiovascular risk profiles for patients. Um, uh, it also prioritizes lifestyle rather than, rather than medications, although it does look at medication interventions in people in terms of cardiac risk. And this is a patient-specific risk, so this can be used at point of care. Uh, and this is a very small diagram and I realize you can't uh, you can't see it but uh, and the uh, whoops that's not going to work so the black bar is is a person's individual risk at the time when you see them this is all processed data from uh, the Simpson database um, using this and as you go uh, to to the right it shows what happens um, if you uh, change various lifestyles, add various medications in terms of the patient's cardiovascular risk. So this can be a very uh, good dynamic tool uh, to use at the point of care, um, again, using process DMR data to, to, um, uh, to back it up. The um, uh, problem was that the company was bought out and they decided they didn't want to actually come to Canada. Uh, and they stayed in the U.S. So um, this was a demonstration project, and unfortunately, we're not going to carry on. The third thing I want to talk about is um, uh, linkage, and uh, electronic medical record data is um, is rich and deep, um, but it's difficult to to find outcomes and other uh, other important information. So linking EMR data to uh, other administrative data is very important and we have done this um, we've been able to do this in several provinces including Ontario uh, with ISIS and uh, we've uh, we have a uh, identifier um, as I said a Sipson identifier that we um, send directly to ISIS and we have a um, uh, the database that goes to ISIS in separate packages, so we never actually see the identification of the patient. The patient is identified at ISIS, um, which has the ability to do that, and then we can um, link to a variety of databases uh, that are sitting there. So that is actually, for us, uh, a really important um, uh, step. Um, uh, we're, I think we're way behind uh, other people, particularly uh, in Europe, in doing this, but um, we've done a small demonstration with diabetes. The linkage works well, um, and it'll be, um, I think, a, a really valuable um, uh, future tool for studying uh, chronic disease. Thanks.
Okay. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Brent and uh, Kahai and Infoway for inviting me here to present. Uh, it's been a great day yesterday. I'm sure we're going to have an equally good day today. Um, and I think my my comments are going to be a nice follow-on to Rick's. So, um, okay. So um, we were asked to sort of talk about uh, tools or algorithms or methodologies, basically something that's kind of nice and shiny and interesting to talk about in terms of how. Uh, we're helping to transform uh, data into usable information for the healthcare system. So, um, as most of you will know, um, ISIS is, a, is a, an institute that has a whole a wide range of data uh, that are available uh, that we uh, link routinely and use for both health system improvement and, and research purposes. I'm going to just, in my few minutes here, talk, uh, focus on, on, on two things. One is, uh, and they're in red, you'll see uh, on to the uh, right, uh, derived chronic condition cohorts. Uh, and I'll tell you what, more about what that means in a moment. And also I'm going to speak uh, about EMR data and how we're using that in creating these cohorts. So uh, following on, on, on Rick's comments. Um, so essentially what when we have all sorts of data, we have data on every hospitalization that occurs in the province, every emergency room visit, every physician claim, uh, with diagnosis codes for all of those things, um, and yet it can still be a challenge to identify who truly has congestive heart failure in the population, who truly has uh, COPD, who truly has asthma. It's not enough to have a single diagnostic code and a physician claim or a, or a discharge abstract to say that that patient has has that condition. And so what the derived uh, uh, chronic condition cohorts uh, do is uh, our, our researchers have created algorithms that draw data from multiple data sets. So for example, uh, the discharge abstract database looking at hospitalizations, but also physician claims, uh, and look for patterns and, and frequencies of, of, uh, of these uh, diagnoses to be able to say with, with high specificity that the patient truly does have diabetes, hypertension, COPD, and so on. Once you've done that and validated those algorithms, and, and traditionally the way we did that was to actually go out and, and pull charts, primary care charts uh, or hospital charts, uh, and actually have trained abstract who would go through and validate that yes, indeed, these patients have that condition. Um, what we're now able to do uh, with, by, by virtue of having EMR data in-house, primary care uh, EMR data, SIPSIN being one example, we have another data set called Emerald, is that we now can validate those algorithms by comparing them to e electronic medical record data. So rather than having to go physically and abstract them, we can validate them with respect to EMR data. So these are uh, very powerful tools. Um, this is just a screenshot from our data dictionary showing you the range of conditions for which we have validated algorithms, and this is growing all the time. Uh, but we now know at a population level who has asthma, who has CHF, who has COPD, and so on, hypertension, uh, uh, diabetes, uh, who's had an MI, rheumatoid arthritis, and so on. Um, the power of this is that it truly is at a population level. We know within the, we have data on the entire population of Ontario going back many years, and we can, ident we can understand who has these conditions, who has multiple conditions, who has not only diabetes, but also asthma and COPD, uh, and what is their uh, uh, course through, the, uh, through their lifespan in terms of healthcare utilization and, and outcomes. Um, this has been an incredibly powerful for, from a research perspective. Obviously, it's used um, intensively by our, by our scientists. But I think for the purposes of this conference, I, I would focus more on some of the very practical applications of this data. So for example, we are partnered with Health Quality Ontario and produce primary care practice reports for physicians who have, uh, who have uh, requested uh, to receive these practice reports. And one of the tables that we provide as part of these uh, will tell physicians who, uh, how many, with the proportion of patients in their practice who have these conditions based on these derived uh, cohorts and how that compares to other physicians uh, uh, across their Lynn and across Ontario. Similarly, we can tell them among patients who have, for example, diabetes, how are, the, how are they doing in their practice with respect to uh, evidence-based quality measures like hemoglobin A1C testing or cholesterol testing. So this is combining multiple data sets uh, uh, and, and these derived cohorts to provide practitioners with really practical information about what's going on within their practice. And you may be surprised to know that this is not data they can routinely gather from their own EMRs. Uh, EMRs are great at some things, but they're certainly not good, uh, in Ontario anyway, at providing this kind of, this kind of granular information to practitioners. 
The latest uh, derived disease cohort that we've created is on dementia. Um, and so this just shows you the actual algorithm that, that uh, was developed and that we've uh, validated. And again, this was validated by comparing it with um, uh, detailed information in electronic medical records that we have within ISIS. This, is going to be, this has just been published by some of our scientists, um, the validation. Um, and this is also very useful for health system uh, uh, planners. So we're working with the Alzheimer's Society of Ontario, as well as with the Ministry of Health, and have produced uh, recently, very recently, in fact, a number of reports for them on, uh, on, on patients with dementia, on what happens with them in the, in the community in terms of healthcare utilization and outcomes. So just, again, one example of one table from one of these reports. We produced, uh, we, we developed a cohort of patients with newly diagnosed dementia, diagnosed between, uh, in 2007, 2008. And these are all community dwelling individuals with dementia. And then we followed them forward in time uh, over about six years and looked at how their trajectory changes over those six years uh, living in the community. What are, in this case, we're looking at their rate of personal uh, homemaking home care services as compared with a, with a control cohort of individuals who do not have dementia, who are also community dwelling. And you can see how that level of use of home care services increase. You can also identify when these patients uh, enter into long-term care or die, uh, with the idea being that how can we delay their entry into long-term care? What is the necessity uh, to, for provision of, of community services, home care services, in order that these individuals, the entry into long-term care may be delayed? That obviously is much more expensive and for most patients not really a desirable outcome. So again, these sorts of derived cohorts can provide very uh, useful intelligence to the, to the health system and health system decision makers about how various components of the health system work together to influence outcomes for patients with dementia. Um, just a, a quick comment about another, uh, so Rick talked about the Sipson uh, EMR data. Uh, the, the other uh, system that we have is called Emerald, uh, similar to Rick's. Uh, there are about uh, now about 400 family physicians who uh, provide this data to, uh, to ISIS and we've linked that data to our administrative records on about 500,000 patients. And very similar, I just wanted to uh, give a, just demonstrate that we're using this data not only to do things like validate uh, um, uh, administrative data for disease-specific cohorts, but also feeding information directly back to primary care practitioners in a, in a way very analogous to what Rick uh, showed. One thing that he didn't mention and, and uh, I thought, which I think is particularly cool, I'm not a prim primary care physician, but uh, I think is very interesting is this is an example of a, a report for patients with atrial fibrillation. So these are patients within the individual physician's practice and it shows a whole range of evidence-based measures. Uh, are they getting anticoagulation? Have they had um, uh, their heart rate tested and so on and, and um, uh, uh, their blood pressure measured? And if they have not received uh, any of those evidence-based quality indicators, the physician can drill down and identify which patients have not received that and actually call them in or, or undertake whatever additional testing or treatment is required. So I think extremely useful information, very granular at the, at the practice level. I'm going to stop there and I guess we'll take questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you. So this, I think this will fit in very well with these very specific clinical front-end pieces. I'm coming from the Ministry of Health. It's a, it's a higher level. Uh, to put it in context, I'd like to see this pyramid of information where if you start at the very bottom, you have all the granular databases as we collect our administrative data. And it has all of the detail, but it also has some of the challenges of being able to analyze the data, separate databases, separate definitions, all of those aspects. The second layer up, the yellow, are the SMART tables. I love this acronym. I created it. Um, that's why I love it. So standardized methodology, analysis ready tables. So do the hard things once and have it ready for cross-system analysis, linkage, um, answer those questions. So we had emergency room data in two different databases from the physician billings and then other hospitals had knackers. We brought it into a single table. So we could have said that was our final point, except we realized that you might want to know an awful lot more about people in emergency rooms. So we said, well, what about what happened to them? Did they see a specialist in the emergency room? Did they have a CT scan or an ultrasound? And then what about, did they have a GP visit or any contact with the physician seven days before and seven days after? So if you do all of those pre-calculated um, aspects, then you've made a very smart table that you can actually come in, do your linkage or do your analysis without having to go back to the original databases. 
But above that, above the dotted line are the discovery tools. The very top one are sort of the pre-calculated standard, gold standard numbers that are available at the tips of your fingers um, with probably very little interactivity. But then the blue layer are the discovery tools where you're either going into the, the summarized tables, sometimes they're standalone, sometimes it's into the smart tables, sometimes right down into the base. But the key is that you've got tools for different people at different times with, which are already using your standard presets. So you've got a standard vocabulary or terminology or definitions. Your coders don't have to decide what codes to use. It's already in the data. You've got those methodologies. You've decided how to categorize things. And if you do that, you get your comparable information. So standardized methodologies. I think we've referenced uh, chronic conditions, how important it is that we can actually look at chronic conditions. A single year of data will not identify all your diabetics because you identify that particular diagnosis in the year that it was first identified or in the year that it's unstable. But in later years, the physician might just be recording what was actually the issue of the day. So you need some methodology that goes back over time. And we use the Public Health Agency of Canada's definitions, build the registries inside the ministry, different part does that. And so now we have definitions of 25 or so chronic conditions. What we needed to do was to actually find a way of analyzing comorbidities because I think someone said yesterday there are lots of studies on heart failure, lots of on diabetes, but what do you do when you have all these comorbidities? So we've put them into categories of high, medium, and low complexity based not on necessarily math but on consensus. So clinically, how complicated is it to handle these particular types of chronic conditions? Then we've taken that, and this then is what we've done with what we call our health system matrix. So we've actually created smart tables where we've said, let's bring a little bit of data in from all of our databases, put it in one spot, and now let's talk about the health of the population. Now, Douglas is going to next talk about the risk-adjusted grouper that Kaihai is developing. A nice, very detailed methodology, 255 different health conditions. We're not replacing that. This is a very broad level of categorization that makes clinical sense, very simple definitions, but nothing you can get from a single database. End of life is either identified through the PharmaCare program, a physician encounter, hospitalization, or care provided by the health authorities. So that it's scattered, who is receiving palliative care is scattered over four different databases. So you bring them all together. Once you get these very broad categories, it's amazing the analysis that you can get when you're actually putting people into those categories. Now, if you're in multiple categories, we put you into the highest one that represents your highest need for care in the year. Um, and we've really done this for strategic planning. The matrix actually can work at three completely different levels. One, it's a concept. We have a vocabulary, frail, people with high complex chronic conditions. It means that now we have a vocabulary when we're talking about the population, even if a physician is not using the exact same definition that we have in our data, we recognize that people with high complex chronic conditions will use more services in a different way than somebody with medium and low. So it works as a concept. In our analysis, we can look at those populations and we can see the different bundles of services they use and we can see those services over time. And it really has convinced us the importance of stepping outside of a silo and doing cross-system analysis. Now, the database that we've created, our tables, I have to say, this is not an IT project. My analysts, who are experts in the individual databases, we use consensus. What information do we think that we need to bring from those databases? And we've decided to do it at a fiscal year level. One could have done it at different, different ways. One row per person per year, summarizing what we know about their health and how they use the healthcare system. And it's now over almost a 15-year time period. It means that it's ready for cohort analysis, it's ready for strategic planning. And all the way through, standard definitions. If somebody's got a definition and they're already using it like attachment, we steal that definition. It's not up to us to create new ones at that point. And it means that this is a shortcut for analysis, even if people are not using our population segments. So it also means that we can sit 
uh, front-end tools on it for cross-system analysis um, for different users at different levels. And here is sort of a slide from our strategic planning, and I just want to, I know you probably can't read all those categories, but um, when you get the slideshow, you can see that it's got a, a link to a website, and you can read all about that. But the key is we're using these populations in our strategic planning. And if you can identify your target populations, and then the health authorities are looking at the gaps in care, then you're redeveloping the policies and the pathways, what's the appropriate care for that group. Then you monitor, did you actually get those changes? And in the end, the goal is better care. And I think all of us are all aiming for better care in the end through analysis. So now I'm just gonna have three final slides, just lots of different ways of presenting data. So the first one, the circle diagram. Each circle represents the dollars of healthcare that different populations have used. And I have to say that we had to dollarize all of our services to bring them all together. And so we're able to do $11.2 billion out of what we know is $17.6 billion of healthcare that BC spends. So we know we're missing things, but out of the data that we have, the 11.2, we can see the green, the light green is the healthy. So they're using about 620 million out of that 11.2 billion. Healthy people do not use most of the services we're providing. But I wanted to focus on the blue, the residential care. So less than 1% of the population uses 20% of everything we're tracking. So the next, the middle diagram, the bar chart, is looking at the dollars per capita. And we can see the bottom line are the people in residential care using about $60,000 per person. But the key is to go the next stage down. So when you look at people who are entering res care in the year compared to those that are starting their care, the bottom line, the people who are starting their, who have started the year in residential care, 24 hour nursing care, it means that the majority of their $60,000 are residential care, makes sense. But the people who are entering residential care, the bar above that, those are people who are on the trajectory towards residential care. And their $60,000, a lot of it, the orange, is the hospitalization. And the pink are their support services they're using provided by health authorities. So automatically it says that we need to really analyze those residential care clients separately by were they entering or were they already there. And it gives you all those different um, lenses. And because we have multiple years worth of data, we also have that ability to look at trajectories over time. Another set of examples, you can lay our population segments on top of any of our services. So the, the pie chart is laying our population segments across hospital days. And so the blue residential care population uses a relatively small proportion of it. Very large proportion of ALC, very small proportion of total hospital days. The second diagram, too small probably to read, is let's look at our emergency room visits by all the population segments and let's see the days that were used by the high users. The orange days were used by people who visited an emergency room five or more times in the year. So that's an example of a pre-calculated category, high users five times plus in a year. And it says that the end of life populations, uh, would, where the normal population, 20% of all of our days are used by high users, in the end of life population, 50% of their emergency room days are from those high users. And the, you see the end of life, lots of emergency room interventions, high use per person. And it makes you think about the trajectory they're on and could we have done a different way of interacting, interacting with those individuals to give them better care. The bottom diagram is diabetics. So we have diabetics, bottom uh, horizontal axis is how many times did they get hospitalized in the year, and the vertical axis is how many days of care did they have in the year. And the big brown dot in the center is if you just used an average, you would say that those diabetics, I uh, can't read my list, 20% of them would have got hospitalized and I think they would have, should have put on my glasses, well you can see they had that much care. All right. <laughs> in the middle. But what's important is if you laid on the population segments, you'd realize those diabetics are not the same. Put them in the right population segments and they're using a wide variety of hospitals a different way because diabetes was one of their conditions. It was not perhaps the only condition they had. And so the last one is interactive tools. So we do a lot of things. At the beginning, uh, you could just have your Excel on steroids. Lots, so we have like our hospital workload tool, 
lots of pivot tables in the background, I think 50 or 60 pivot tables, but when you open it up, you get a nice front sheet, choose your hospital, and it tells you all sorts of things about the hospital using those predetermined categorizations that you thought, thought were really useful. And then when you're using other visual tools, depending on what you're looking at, there are lots of different ways that you can actually have an interactive tool, whether it's mapping, whether it's you know comparing to a, a provincial average, where you can actually have data available, not pre-done. Don't just produce one table, Excel table, you asked for this, I give you this. You need to have an, an interactive one where then you can stand back and say, did gender make a difference? Did pop segment make a difference? Did age make a difference? Did it change over time? Give them people those um, options. So thank you very much. Well, it's always a challenge to follow Martha and the blue matrix. Can we still say blue matrix? It's not allowed no, anymore. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you can see the common commonalities across the topics, which means I can skip, skip through a couple of slides fairly quickly. And uh, a lot of cross-fertilization as well, as we're building this population grouping methodology at Kai High. Martha's on our expert group, someone from ISIS is on the expert group. And, uh, and I wanted to talk a little bit about methodologies in particular, but uh, I want to say a few pro pro provocative things first. Before we talk about methodologies, I'd like to say, uh, here's a statement, Canada has the best healthcare data in the world. Canada has the best healthcare tools in the world. We need to do more in terms of data and more in terms of tools. But we mostly need to show the value, as Dennis said yesterday, of these data and tools and get clinicians and healthcare managers using the tools they've got in their hands already. But having said that, we still have to work on data and tools. Our big, one of our biggest tools at Kai High is case mix. So I'll talk about case mix and an example, which is the population grouping. Um, this is our model. It's not quite what many people think our model is, which is sort of a secondary collector of data. We are out there helping the health system create data locally. That's our, that's our main role. You heard John Hurdy's talk yesterday about all the inter -I assessments. We're the conduit through which they get created in home care, long-term care, inpatient mental health across the country, and it's meant as a primary care tool. So first of all, it's created in that setting to be used by clinicians for care. It gets sent to us afterwards as a byproduct of that. Same thing with hospitals though, for the DAD data, we want software vendors to sell those specifications to hospitals for them to use it for care, for system planning and utilization management and send it to us afterwards. So we get the data last, that's our goal. We want the system to have it immediately. We want it then to flow through interoperable channels. Uh, we've worked with InfoWay on this to help it get from, to other points of care. So if someone shows up in an emergency department, you can see their assessment. John talked about New Zealand getting ahead in this. Uh, we're, we're working on that. And then we want to get it after all that for system management purposes. Then we can do the pan-Canadian reporting, the risk adjustment, the case mix that we do, and send it back out again so you can understand the system. For something like population grouping, that's one of those uh, that you need to have after the fact, all the data, put it all together, and put it back out there for everybody. Um, so in this case, you can see the client, the assessment being, being done, the care team using it for care planning, and then it comes back to us for system planning purposes. Um, so that's our, that's our general model, and we've been doing this for decades. We've been doing this since before Kai High was actually around. Case Mix has been around for 40 years in Canada. Kai High has been here for 20 years, so we've pulled these things in to create Kai High. We put standards out there, we put specifications for creating data out there, and these decision support tools like Case Mix and quality indicators and caps and things for care planning. For, for the system to use locally and then send it to us afterwards. And uh, we've always done this sector by sector, and you heard Paul talk about all the silos we've got. We're really, really good at data and tools by, by, by sector. We've got case mix for seven different care settings. Finally, we're building a methodology to break across those silos, as you've heard already, to understand the person across that journey, and that's what this population grouping is. Um, it's a little bit different for us because usually case mix gets a data set, we group residents or patients into like groups and we put a weight on them for resource intensity. But we don't have a data set, so we've had to create this gigantic data set. We have billions of records now, physician billing data. The long-term goal would be EMR data. That's the gold standard. And eventually, someday, that'll, that'll be the case. Uh, hospital data, long-term care data, we're starting to get the assessment information from mental health and home care as well. We want to move beyond diagnosis into functioning to really understand the person. Um, so the entire population, whether it's a region or a province or a country, and over a long time period, you have to build up if someone has diabetes, you can't just see one encounter, you have to really understand what's going on there. And we want to have that profile of the person and then build indicators, what is, build some cost weights. What's your expected uh, resource use this year, next year? What's your uh, predicted uh, mortality, uh, uh, rate of hospitalization, that kind of thing. So we have to do this first step, which we don't ordinarily do in case mix, which is actually build up this profile. So billions of records, 
Uh, we've got 23 million Canadians in now, so we have data from Alberta, BC, Ontario, some from Saskatchewan. So it's a good chunk of the population already. And we have to tick, uh, Martha already stole my thunder, 255 conditions that we tag. We've had people with dozens and dozens of conditions. This is very diagnosis based. We want to get to more functioning, things like frailty and uh, things like that that really, really uh, help understand the person. But you can see Joe here has got three different uh, tags or three different conditions tagged to him. That's the first step. And we're using all this information from building data. We've got ICD-9, ICD-10, and interi information. Um, and then we want to put those weights on. So how much, is this, how much resources is this person likely to use this year and next year? Uh, you have to do that for the entire population. Many people, of course, are non-users of the system. They're in there. We use basic socio-demographic information. We've got people that are in the system but don't have any conditions. They're healthy. And people with many conditions. I'll show that in a second. So some of the um, applications, I've got a slide or two on this really understanding across the continuum. That's the key for this kind of methodology. And understanding your high users. You've heard a lot about high users. I've got a slide on that in a second. And then doing risk adjustment. Now I can start to understand some people are sicker, some people are less sick. What's the burden in my catchment area or my region? And it could be used for funding. So provinces like Ontario are always interested in methodologies that might be used for funding. So it could be used for capitation. It could be used even at the regional level. But I have to say, the bigger the region, the simpler the risk adjustment you need. So this might be overkill for a large uh, regional analysis. Um, so this is the uh, this is the, uh, the third of the distribution. Non-users at the bottom, people with only zero conditions or one condition at the, near the bottom. So you can see as people age, that orange bar gets bigger and bigger. You have many, many more conditions. So it's easy, and this is based on 23 million people, so you can already see this is uh, the picture in a good chunk of Canada. Looking at high users, this is just the deciles based on conditions. So the top decile there, this is a healthy population. Non-users are essentially no conditions, 0 0.2 health conditions per person, and are not spending, they're not taking up any resources. They're not even going to the doctor. The bottom 10th decile, 62% of resources being used by that 10%. Average of eight conditions each. And again, we want to get more in terms of frailty and uh, other measures of functioning in here. This is just the first cut. We've released an alpha and a beta release for uh, jurisdictions to look at. ISIS is reviewing it. Uh, Saskatchewan's looking at it. And we're, get, we're gearing up for a major release in the coming fiscal year. Uh, so we've got all that. I can now, as I said, you can get expected costs for the uh, uh, concurrent period and for the um, uh, future period coming up. I can then look at your case mix index. So if I look at regions A, B, and C there, I can say, well, it looks like region C has a heavier population, a sicker population. They're, they're consuming more resources they need, or they need more resources. Uh, then I can look at their cost per weighted case or their the new term, risk-adjusted average cost, um, and how much are we spending per weighted case? So Region A is spending a lot of money per weighted case. You can start to look at how much are we spending, not per case, but per weighted case, and why are they spending more per, if we've sort of normalized the cases, why are they spending more? And then you could even fund on that. So you could say, this would be the funding for those three regions. Um, what's coming up? The, real, the, the big thing for us is we're not in each silo anymore. This is a different business for case mix and for Kai Hai a little bit to, uh, to work across the silos. This is a big evolution for case mix. We're looking at things like um, bundled payments. Uh, can we do case mix across an entire episode of care from, from a hip problem all the way up to a hip replacement and rehab instead of in each sector? Um, definitely supporting people like Martha and others with, with, with policy making, uh, using this sort of high level analysis of case mix. And, we're hoping for more data, maybe EMR data in the future, and uh, more population grouping. Good morning. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the meeting organizers for inviting us here today uh, to give you a bit of a glimpse of what StatCan does in terms of transforming uh, data into information. Am I going to get the right one? Okay, great. So I think there's been a great progression here in the panel, starting off with more at the clinical level, working provincial, and finally ending up at national. And I'm going to keep us at the national level. But what I'd like to do is start to think about a bit, bit broader in terms of what really affects health and looking at this from perhaps more of a social determinants uh, lens and to give you some examples of how uh, StatsCan is capitalizing on some of the unique data sets we have to start to inform some outcomes related to health and healthcare use. So we're data rich. I don't think there's going to be much uh, argument with that. I think most folks are, uh, uh, know that we run the National uh, Health Survey with the CCHS on a regular basis. We also hold uh, many of the uh, uh, administrative databases at the national level, including cancer, vital statistics. We receive now, uh, through data sharing agreements with Kaihai, various other databases, including the DAD. So 
we have a, a rich environment in terms of our health-related database, but what we also have are non-health-related databases that can inform um, the outcomes of Canadians. And I include things like the immigrant landing file that we receive from CIC, uh, our census data, as well as income tax data. And so what I'd like to describe today is as opposed to any single tool, the process through which we use a series of tools to integrate this information through record linkage primarily to do research and analysis, which we think in the end is an important output and an information source, but also then how we use that information uh, in some of our more sophisticated tools, which are our microsimulation models, to integrate this information. So here's the challenge. How do you explain microsimulation in five minutes? Think about it as predictive analytics on steroids. So it's the, a tool that allows us to integrate not just predictive algorithms, but other sources of information, apply those at the individual level to a population, i.e. Canada. We age people over time, and their real purpose is to look to the future. What is the projected incidence of disease? What are projected costs? And allows us to do what if scenarios. So that I think is a unique uh, feature of what we can bring to the table. The developer of which is here, so you have more questions, you can see Michael. Um, so let me begin. First of all, one of the tools that we have developed in the last several years is a new uh, platform uh, to do record linkage in a must, much more efficient and cost-effective way and standardized way. So what we've done essentially is build a population register which is at the center, which includes unique identifying information for all Canadians and we did that using core databases because as you all know, there is no real national population register. What that allows us to do is bring together data from our surveys as well as our administrative data, which in many cases do not share common identifiers. So there is no health insurance number across all these that allows us to do this easily. Sometimes we have names, sometimes we have HIN, sometimes we have SIN, and so this uh, tool now will allow us to bring uh, data sources together in a much more efficient manner. So what I'd like to do is take one example and walk you through that three-stage process of linkage analysis and microsimulation to give you a flavor for how we uh, transform data into information. So we had been receiving over the last several years more and more requests about trying to understand the projected need for long-term care. As it's already been discussed, John Hurdy's mentioned, other mentioned, the need to understand the impact of the aging population. In most cases, projections for long-term care right now are simply based on age and sex. We know at a certain point in time, if you are a certain age and a certain gender, you have a certain probability of being in a long-term care. There are small studies which have been done to show that other factors matter, but nothing at the population level. What you really need to do that is to develop a prospective cohort. We need to identify a representative sample of seniors that are living in their home, know a lot about them, follow them over time, and figure out who ends up in long-term care. And we were able to create that cohort by linking our CCHS, which has very comprehensive information on health, uh, chronic conditions, but also socioeconomic status, their marital status, and we were able to link that to the 2011 census to identify who was still in a private dwelling versus who was in long-term care and residential care. We were able to take that information, analyze it, determine some factors that really drove who ended up in long-term care by census day. We knew going in and hoped uh, that we would see something like Alzheimer's disease, huge predictor of entering long-term care. We saw that yesterday in John Hurdy's data about the proportion of people in long-term care with Alzheimer's. So this really confirmed what we expected to see. But what we, other, what we saw were other determinants that were important. So for example, losing a spouse was key. We were able to ascertain your marital status at the time of CCHS and at the time of the census. And if you lost your spouse, you were more likely to be in long-term care. We were also able to look at the impact of receiving home care, which we expected. But then looking at things like immigrant status, for example, which hard to tell on the graph, but is actually below one. That's in fact, a, has a protective effect. If you are an immigrant, uh, you're actually less likely to end up in long-term care. 
And so the power of these data are that not only can we look at an outcome, which is ender, um, ending up in long-term care, but we can take a more social determinants of care approach to understand not just the health, but the other determinants that may be driving that. So this work is soon bound for uh, publication, we hope. So next, what I want to talk a little bit about is how do we use this information as well as other parameters and sources of data that we have gathered from provinces and other places in order to feed a microsimulation model to look at projections uh, over time in the next 10, 20 years of what does the world look like in terms of demand for long-term care. Um, so we developed a um, population health model with a neurological focus. This was part of a national study on neurological diseases that was led by the Public Health Agency of Canada and included all the major neurological disease charities and was funded by the federal government. And StatsCan's contribution was to develop a microsimulation model to look at what does the future look like. So here's very simple basic graphics just to show you what happens. So really what a microsimulation model does is it starts with a population at birth. It looks year over year at people. Here's the first individual, lucky enough not to get any condition, dies at, at age 86. Next person comes along, he's in fact diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, and that person then dies at a younger age of 78. Next person comes along, they also are diagnosed with Alzheimer's at 76. They, in fact, are admitted to a long-term care institution and then die after at age 92. And this goes on and on. We, over the years, also accumulate what kind of health care costs these individuals are accumulating over time. And this model will run and repeat 32 million times to estimate what's going on at the national population very powerful tools for not just Alzheimer's but other diseases that we have to take that future forward-looking look at a population level and not only could we look at what happens status quo but what does this look like if we think Alzheimer's rates are increasing for example. So in having prepared this one I only had five minutes I'm going to limit the number of um, outcomes that we can look at. So these kind of models can look at projections of diseases over time, but one of the things it can also do is look at projected healthcare costs. So we can, because it's a population-based sample in microsimulation, we can actually look at costs of individuals who do and do not have Alzheimer's disease and look at various counterfactual uh, examples to see what is the additional cost of having Alzheimer's. And a lot of this information, by the way, was based on provincial level costing data that we were able to obtain from British Columbia and I believe one other on, in Ontario. So that was a very uh, important partnership to have. So we see that in 2011, about $6.7 billion were costs that were additional costs attributable to individuals who had Alzheimer's. That estimate is expected to be $13.3 billion by 2031. So, this gives us a chance to look to the future. This is, again, status quo not changing anything. The majority of those costs are uh, uh, related to long-term care. And what we can do with these models is look at different what-if scenarios. What does the cost of long-term care look like if, in fact, we think Alzheimer's rates are going down? Or there's an alternative place to put individuals. So this just gives you a very quick glimpse at the kind of tools that we use and how we capitalize on some of the data that are unique to Statistics Canada in order to inform some of the health outcomes and health care use at the population level. And we would be happy to chat with any of you who uh, might be interested in more. Thanks very much. Well, thanks to all the speakers. And I'm extremely impressed with uh, your ability to, uh, to manage your own time. I don't think I had to put up any cards or anything like that. Um, Claudia did mention needs to have five, and then they had eight minutes. When we when we met to discuss the session, there was such a palpable level of disappointment. I think in the panel, at five minutes, we decided to make it eight and and have a shorter question period. And I hope you agree that I'll get to the questions. I hope you'll agree that uh, um, those extra three minutes were worth worth time. These are some very uh, incredible projects. Uh, some really passionate uh, individuals leading and working on them, and uh, a great tour from 
from sort of the, pa the sort of clinical patient level all the way to the population level. So we have uh, time for a few questions, and there's going to be lots. So I don't know. I'll start uh, in the back, and we'll work our way across. Hi, I'm Carol Mulder. I work with family health teams in Ontario, and I just wanted to address, um, uh, as a matter of hope, actually, some of the comments that were made here about EMR data in the future. And I just wanted to share, and this is largely um, uh, by capitalizing on the work that Sipson has been doing, is that the family health teams of Ontario have decided to band together and start trying to translate that work into frontline work. And they've done that. Now we've done it with four or three, three uh, diseases, the diabetes, the COPD, congestive heart failure, depression is due in June. Um, and what they've done is they've taken that work and translated that into standardized, tested queries, not just everybody off on their own doing their own query, which has been a problem for quite some time. And so they've taken this now, and now we have it in five EMRs which is about 85 to 90% of the family health teams in Ontario, which is about 3 million of the patients. So it's not all of them. But the point I want to make is that the EMR, the access to standardized, useful data from the EMR for this purpose is here. It's not in the future, it's here. And it is thanks to the work that, that's being done. So we've leveraged the, the Simpson stuff in particular, the Emerald stuff, um, uh, the CHI, VRS, like some of your case studies coming out of that, and taken it to the front lines. And the reason why I think it's really important for this group to be aware of that is that this information is not going to change what happens in healthcare unless the providers change what they do. And they won't change what they do with two-year-old data or a year and a half of data. They need to know, as one of you was pointing out, to be able to drill down into their own patient and then make a change. And so I wanted to give a message of hope and gratitude that, that the idea of getting EMR data, useful EMR data from primary care, is actually already happening thanks to the work that, that's already happening. So I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to pick up on that. Um, one of the things that I think would be really great to do that should be obvious that it should be done is, is the, the linkage of other data into the EMR. So we did a, a study several years ago that showed that if we sent family doctors a uh, flag around falls from home care clients, we actually saw substantial reductions in actual falls uh, afterward. And we, we've kind of been stuck at this point where we, we don't have an approach to get home care assessments done by case managers with the intro instruments in eight provinces into the family doctor's uh, EMR. It, it's technically doable, it's just, it just hasn't happened. Um, and it would be a huge payoff, because what that would mean is that every family doctor in real time would have access to a comprehensive geriatric assessment done on their own clients. Um, and I, I think it's just been one of these missed opportunities because people mm -hmm. haven't seen the, the, the chance to do it and should figure out a way to act on that sort of thing. I think, I think that was uh, in Michael Green's opening remarks yesterday, talking about um, um, extending the value of digital health through interoperability of, of clinical information in the circle of care is really important. So uh, we've got uh, Christine and then Sheila. Oh, Rick's going to make a comment. Sorry, I'm I being just, a bit too expedient with <laughs> No, that's all right. I just want to make a comment about both those. Um, I think uh, you're, uh, both are, are sort of right on in terms of where we should be going. And, and I think a disappointment for a lot of family doctors and other primary, primary practitioners is um, the lack of being able to get their own data out of an EMR system. It's a huge frustration or put in useful data. Um, and, uh, you know, the vendor community um, hasn't had exactly receptive ears to being able to do this. And I, I think they're, they're, one of the things is that, you know, we have a number of vendors across the country uh, of EMRs who uh, need to be more responsive and, and to start to uh, pay attention to the the requests of their clients. Just to pick up on, on that, I think there, there's the ability of the, the EMR system itself to produce useful information for the family physician. There's also the challenge of actually 
um, uh, abstracting the information from the EMR to, to do the kind of linkage that John is referring to, um, or if you want to look not just at your own practice, but to compare across practices or look at longer term outcomes of uh, information that's not available in your EMR. I think there's, this is a challenge currently, mm -hmm. is, is certainly in terms of having real-time updates of EMR. Mm -hmm. uh, we're still stuck at having periodic updates. This is an area, I think, where InfoWay, for example, could play a huge role in terms of, there are tools out there, there's certainly the technologies out there, but I think creating the opportunity to le really leverage that at a population level is an area where I would see a huge opportunity for, for InfoWay to, to leverage existing investments that have been made uh, in EMRs across the country. Thanks. Christine. Follow up on the same flavor here, and I guess it goes to the concept of push reports versus pull reports. And in the ideal world, we would just pull the information you need out of your EMR and have it available to action. Um, that being said, we know there's complications with that, and obviously the panelists have made great strides in providing information so people can action it. I want to get to the specifics about EMR data and that actionability. And uh, the people, and maybe it's more specific to ISIS and, and SIPSIM, the people who are participating, are they the people who are more apt to make change in their practice? Are they seeing the noticeable improvements in their population health within their practice? Is this measurable? Are we keeping people out of the acute care system by having them properly treated in primary care? Um, or do you have a cohort of people within your population that are participating that perhaps are just not paying attention to the reports or not actually as they come in? Are you following those kind of metrics around the data? I think those are all really good questions, um, of which I have very few answers at the moment. Uh, I guess what I would say is, in 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 for primary care practitioners, uh, the currency of of their work is still one patient at a time, and the idea that I I'm responsible for a, a population. Uh, and I, I can now look at data around that population and start to make some changes in my practice that may improve the care and, uh, of individual patients um, is really recent. And I think you're right. I think a lot of the people who, uh, the physicians who have joined uh, Sipson uh, are, are thinking that way, um, but there are a lot of people who aren't yet. I mean, I think that's a great point, and I think the ch one of the challenges here is we tend to think about primary care as patients who are seeing primary care physicians. A lot of patients who aren't seeing primary care physicians who need to see primary care physicians, and if we're going to make that switch, you, you clearly need data that goes beyond what's in your, your EMR because there are patients who aren't even coming to you, and to have that population lens requires population level data. So I think... Um, uh, I, th I think the bringing together of these varied data sources through various uh, StatsCan, KaiHi, or our, our institutions um, uh, is, is hugely important if we're going to make the shift towards managing populations as opposed to managing the patient who happens to be sitting in the chair in front of uh, our desks. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think Sheila. Yeah, just a, a real carry on from Christine's question. So, with the Emerald and the Simpson databases, do they, um, how do you find the physicians? I'm assuming it's voluntary. Do you pay them? How many are there? What's the incentive for them? Um, how, you know, if you approach 10, how many will come on? So, can you talk about the recruitment process a little bit? I, I'll just briefly say, I mean, so. Karen Tu, uh, Lisa Jackamine, and Rick Glazier are the physicians at ISIS who've been leading the development of Emerald. Um, it, it's very much, it's a, this is a on the ground game. This is going to primary care conferences and telling family doctors about this great system called Emerald and wouldn't you like to participate? It's all voluntary, nobody's being paid. Uh, the, the, the quid pro quo, I think, is feedback of information. And I think, I think that, you know, you, clearly the re representat representativity of those family doctors with respect to all family doctors, hard to say. Hard to say. I'm sure this is, these are early adopters. Uh, and I guess it's up to us to demonstrate value. Thanks. I guess oh. just to add to that, uh, we, we, um, at, when we started, we, we paid physicians to, uh, to cover administrative costs. Uh, uh, as, to join Simpson, um, uh, we don't have to do that anymore. People are lining up, wanting to join, uh, because they are starting to get their data back. That is is useful, um, and the so we have a variety of incentives. I think the data is is the major incentive, but also uh, physicians can get CME credits for um, looking at their data, reflecting on it, 
and then they fill out a form for the college. And that is a, a, a growing sort of incentive for them to participate. Can I make one other comment? I'm just uh, speaking about the, the payment issue, this is expensive work to gather this data. Emerald is funded as a research project, so it goes from research grant to research grant. Sipson similarly is on funding from various agencies. This is not seen as data infrastructure in the same way that the DAD is or that uh, NACRS is and so on. I think that's a real weakness. Uh, we, we need to see this as this is routine data like any of those other data sets. We need to fund it in that way. We need to leverage it in that way. Um, and, uh, you know, until we get there, uh, we're not going to be doing it. We, certainly governments are funding the, the, the implementation of EMRs at the patient, at the practice level, but then the data sits at the practice level, uh, and that's, I think, a real uh, weakness at this point. Time for two more questions. So Michael and then Paul. So go ahead, Michael. Sorry, Robin. I'll try to be quick. After. First, the squawk. I sat on the Federal Provincial Territorial Committee in 92 that uh, gave birth to InfoWay. And one of the key objectives of InfoWay, or whatever it was going to be, was interoperability. So when I hear you, Richard, say, wouldn't it be nice if the vendors paid more attention? 20 years ago, they were supposed to be interoperable. Uh, two questions. One, on the Archimedes business, I was just quickly looking here. Doug Manuel did a, uh, and company did a study showing that immigrant status mattered for cardiovascular disease risk. Archimedes is a black box, so even if you got it, are you comfortable using a black box risk prediction algorithm? And second question to, to Martha, you know, this is really neat stuff and all that. What happens when somebody says, gee, this is really neat, I'd like to explore more deeply the pattern? Is there a feedback loop where you actually go down to the bottom layer of the pattern <coughs> and do more uh, exploratory data analysis, for example? I, I, I can go first. Um, uh, I think you make a, a really good point. Uh, because um, they decided not to come to Canada, we did not do any further exploration of that black box, but you're absolutely right. I think that uh, looking inside and seeing what the elements are uh, uh, would be uh, really important uh, as, in terms of comfort with, uh, with using it at the practice level. So thank you, Michael, for saying that you thought it was an interesting project. Um, we can do a lot of things with... He doesn't say that a lot of yeah. well, That's great. It's, it's been blessed. I'll take it to heart, yes. Um, I think... Uh, I'm looking out at some of my health authority colleagues, and I think one of our biggest challenges is actually to have the health authorities being able to access the same data, because we have, like, physician data, they don't have that, they've got data that we don't have. And I think what we really need to do is to be able to, to share that. So once we get over that hurdle, I think there'll be an awful lot more. Meanwhile, in the ministry, yes, we can do this broad level analysis at those smart table levels. But the data is such wealth, you know, from either a ministry or a research or health authority perspective, to be able to do that longitudinal or deep dive. I think that the neat part is that it's now being thought of as we need to do cross-system analysis, we need to do cross-time analysis, rather than the silos that we had not that long ago. I think, Claudia, you want to jump in on this? I just wanted to um, follow up on Michael's point about um, using um, algorithms that perhaps don't know the black box and maybe looking at other um, variables and I, I think this is where we could also play a role that um, working with Doug Manuel there have been a lot of predictive models that have been built on linked CCHS data for that explicit purpose of being able to capture that range of of variables, but also to be able to apply those algorithms mm -hmm. in the context of anybody who has CCHS data can use it and look at what's happening uh, in their health region. For example, Laura Rosella, who's using the Deport one. So I think there's a possibility here for some translation of maybe taking some of those algorithms that were originally based on survey data, which really do not require huge amounts of information, and maybe see how those can be applied uh, to some of the uh, primary care data. So there's a, some consistency there. Mm -hmm. So I think that's another way in which, um, you know, not just sharing the data, but sharing the tools and the algorithms mm -hmm. might be helpful. Douglas, you want to jump just in? Just one add about the black box comment. I think that's really important. One of the reasons why the jurisdictions kept coming to us and asking us to build a population group was because ours wouldn't be a black box and the alternatives yeah. out there generally are. So I'm being told by <laughs> the people in charge I have to uh, end the session. So I apologize to those who didn't get to make a comment or a question and perhaps in the broader group, uh, you'll have that chance. Um, I want to thank our uh, presenters for uh, 
sharing their wares with us and uh, join me in that.